it is for special operations as a whole, from what I've seen, to include combat arms, infantry, and all those guys, is compartmentalization is our greatest strength. It's also our biggest weakness. Is that, you know, you can lose a buddy in the moment, you compartmentalize it, you move on to drive on and complete the mission. Um, and for some, they can part- compartmentalize for years, but eventually that pot is going to boil over. And I know it did for for all of us in, in different ways. Uh, thank you for upfront for opening up and being vulnerable because I know this is not going to be easy for all of us. Doug, you you said it this morning as we had uh, breakfast before this that every time you see us, it's like a reminder of uh, of Mikey. That's just when I see you guys, it's the same exact thing, and I, I don't want that to be that way. But maybe it it, it just is. But um, guys, I want the audience to learn a little about you guys so doug we'll, we'll start with with you where you're born raised what led you to the seal teams and, and your seal career and then uh and then benny oh uh, thanks for having us um uh born and raised in georgia uh you know middle class family uh graduated high school held a couple different jobs positions always had an affinity for the military always read the old vietnam era books mac v uh, you know, those types of things, you know, what the SEALs did in Vietnam, what the Rangers did in Vietnam, the the LERPs, et cetera. And for whatever reason, you know, it didn't come uh, from a traditional military family background. Uh, uh, grandfather was in World War II. Uh, father was in National Guard during Vietnam time. Uh, but I just couldn't shake the, the bug of wanting to go and, you know, join and see if I could make it through the program. Uh, I did that. Um, 2000 and you know and uh, wound up at uh, requesting all east coast teams and unbeknownst to me best thing that could ever happen wound up at SEAL Team 3 um, did my first three platoons there half of me you know, all my formative years at SEAL Team 3 uh, you know so you know best time of my life uh, I remember distinctly walking down the back stairs of SEAL Team 3 for the last time taking my first you know billet somewhere other than the team and and it was a sad moment, you know. Um, did three platoons there. Uh, did a stand as a buds instructor for a couple of years. Uh, did uh, five years almost at SRT one, uh, following you know Ramadi 0506 time frame. Uh, did a stand up in Kodiak, Alaska, and then you know some of the stuff we're going to talk about later, leadership wise. Uh, did a stand at our logistical support unit, uh, supporting all the West Coast teams. We have a handful of SEALs that work there, uh, kind of bridging the gap between the loggy side of the house and the SEAL side of the house, uh, which, you know, coincidentally set me up for after my career. You know, I retired in about six months after sitting around twiddling my thumbs, wondering, okay, what's life got left for me here? Uh, a friend of mine uh, owns a company, um, builds rocket launchers, brought me out, and we talked about it this morning as well brought me out and I as I always jokingly tell him because he was a Vietnam Air Marine um, and we give each other a lot of grief about our choices and and, uh, you know basically I sealed it you know I I came in and I you know did my senior list to seal thing and and looked at it and and offered some what I thought was you know sage observations and one thing led to another and and now I'm running that company uh, as his president so uh, and we, it's been great for me. It's been a great honor, uh, you know, kind of transitioning out of the military. A lot of us get stuck with what's next in life. It's a very difficult transition, especially for, at least from our community. Um, so having something uh, that drives you, something you're committed to for whatever reason, allows you and allowed me the opportunity to make, I would say, a much better transition than some guys that I know. Uh, you know, it, it's it's back to what I lived for all those years in the community. It's travel, it's hotels, it's living out of bag, but it's, you know, trying to give yourself to a greater purpose. And it's as a senior enlisted, retired, and now here in the current role, it is uh, continuing to deal with those types of leadership uh, hurdles. Um, so that's where I'm at today. Benny, I think it's safe to uh, say for the audience, we, I mean, we, we've got to say this, that Doug was well suited for the job he's doing now. Because he always, he always had something modified to all his weapons, which we're, I think technically we're not supposed to do. But he was always trying to find a way to make the weapon systems. But 
yeah, more so effective. You know how you do that, though. You have to, you know, one, you have to be a, a gear junkie. Uh, we call it something else, but clean uh, podcast here. But uh, gear junkie. And then what you have to do is you have to sell the most senior person that's got the most pull on it uh, at the team. And I did that. <laughs> so it allowed me the latitude to, uh, you know, do some things here and there. The one thing I respected about you is you were, you were always looking for the, the 1% advantage. Because if you stack up enough of those one percent advantages, they they start to add up, and and you you had a curiosity in your in, in your belly about how to make things better. Which the best leaders I've always seen, regardless of how much tenure they have, they don't sit on their laurels. They're always asking like, "Hey, this may be a tradition, but if tradition is no longer relevant, how do we do it better?" I I do have to say though that. He brought out a 1911 one time that he had that 1% advantage on. And I just had our <laughs> normal issued Sig Sauer. And we were doing a pistol, or a pistol competition. And I still beat him. And I, I won the shotgun that, that, that tournament or whatever. So I, I, he, he might be trying to get those one-up advantages. But it all just sometimes comes down to the operator. So. <laughs> touche, touche. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah, we'll, we'll always one-up each other on, uh, on the show. Yeah, That's just the... Sure. Uh, that's the competitive military uh, way, uh, Benny. So, uh, again, yeah, thank you. This is a definitely an honor. It's a privilege to be able to do this. Uh, I was born and raised in central Wisconsin. Uh, average kid, did uh, the hunting and the fishing growing up. Uh, I would say I was an average student. I uh, wasn't too driven in school, so my idea of going on to college wasn't a thing, so I ended up uh, going kind of the military route, um, and my, my parents were on board with it, so they actually had to sign me in when I was 17, and I remember going to the recruiting station, and this was, I was still kind of torn between, do I go, you know, Navy, Marines, Army, you know, I didn't really have a, a chosen path yet, but I got to the Navy recruiting office, and I remember there being a poster hanging there, and that poster... Um, I don't remember exactly what it said, but it was something like he won't win this year's MVP or be voted to the all-star team. But then again, some heroes don't play games. And it was a picture of a Navy SEAL coming up out of the water with his rifle. And I was like, that's what I want to do. Um, and I think the recruiter probably laughed at me because, you know, I'm only five, six. I think at the time I was, uh, I was a wrestler in my senior year. So I was only like 112, you know, I was just you know, a hundred pounds of soaking wet. Um, so he probably laughed at me, but once you have that, that goal in your mind and you have that drive, uh, that's what I wanted. And that's what I, I fought for. Um, so I, I enlisted in the Navy with a, a goal and a dream to become a Navy SEAL. Um, like I said, I was only 17, turned 18 in boot camp. had orders to buds. Um, I got rolled, uh, initially for some knee issues, but ended up uh, graduating with class 232. And then checked in the SEAL Team 3 right around the same time Doug did. And uh, I was fortunate enough, I did five platoons. Um, I went from a brand new guy to post-platoon chief. So that's basically unheard of. Um, Normally, like Doug said, you only do about three platoons before you're kind of forced out to rotate and do uh, a different job, kind of give back to the community, whether it's an instructor billet or um, uh, rotating just to a different uh, duty station. I kind of, uh, I would say I kind of begged and pleaded to stay at the command um, just because I liked being operational. Um, and part of it, I think, was because I didn't want to do any change. I liked deploying. I liked being operational. Uh, so like I say, I finished up my platoon chief slot to, uh, uh, to Afghanistan, and then uh, I went over to BUDS, became a dive phase instructor during uh, second phase. Um, and then out of BUDS, I got a commissioning as a warrant officer, Went over to Team 5 for two rotations uh, as a training officer. And when we deployed, I became the current operations officer. And then after that, I was kind of tired of deploying to the desert. So I took orders out to Hawaii, did my final three years out in Hawaii. And uh, I was the operations officer at our training detachment there in Hawaii for the SEAL delivery vehicles. I did 21 and a half years. Uh, I thought I was going to be the career 33 uh, CW05 retired, but uh, medically my body started to kind of shut down once I took a, a desk job, and uh, it was really hard for me to get the word retirement out of my mouth. Um, but once it did, uh, I'm kind of glad I did, and now I don't 
really look back. Uh, my purpose right now is I'm a stay-at-home dad, so I've been doing that for about a year, uh, especially with this whole pandemic going on. My uh, kids are virtual, going to school right now, so it definitely helps uh, to be home with them, which is good. Um, yeah, that's me right now. So both of you, you know, at, at, at a SEAL team, when you have two deployments under your belt, that's considered uh, experience. And, and both of you guys had two combat deployments under your belt. And so we get back from the 05 deployment uh, in which mainly NSW forces were in Baghdad doing the personal security detail mission as well as direct action, action raids, Habani as well. So you guys get back and you're told, hey, uh, due to the state of the war in Iraq, which things were not going well, you don't have two years to get ready to go back. You only have one year. And so you guys jump into a training cycle. Uh, you're in task in a bruiser with Jocko Willink and uh, you guys are crushing the training. You're doing well. You're the best task unit. And then three weeks from deployment, you find out you're going to the worst place in the world as voted by Time Magazine in 2005, 2006, AR Ramadi, in which at this point it was the caliphate for Al-Qaeda. And for the listeners, if you don't know what caliphate means, it means their capital. And this is an embarrassment to the U.S. military that we allowed this to happen in 2005. Al-Qaeda actually owned Ramadi, and Ramadi is the third largest city in Iraq, located in Al-Ambar province, which is the westernmost province. So you guys find out you're going to Ramadi. What, what are the general feelings at that point? Is it excitement? Is it trepidation? What, what, what are you guys feeling? I mean, I was completely excited. I mean, getting geared up or ramped up to go back out in 06. I mean, I was more than excited to get back to home. For myself, yeah. So we do these hellacious workups that a lot of times are harder than the actual deployments themselves. So we've got two in our in our back pocket, right? two deployments, two workups, and then we get the word that we're going to Ramadi. So at this point, we're like, hell yes, it it's our time. Like we've put in the hard work, we put in the effort. It's our time to go to war. This is what we've been training for. It's it's our time. Uh, we were super ecstatic. We were excited. Um, we were hungry. We wanted it. Um, <coughs> and like I say, we, we were ready. Um, we we did that year long workup, and we you know it was hard work to get ready for it, but we. We trained uh, specifically more towards the things that we knew that we'd need for that deployment. So a lot of the, the maritime stuff went out the window. You know, it was more of the land-based stuff. It was more of the, the urban environment stuff. So we we absolutely 100% thought we were ready for it. Um, and then we get there, and uh, I think we were ready, but we weren't that ready. <laughs> you get to Ramada. You're excited. And then reality slaps you in the freaking face. And I'm sure the reality set in early in deployment when Cowie was shot through the leg that, oh, this, this is as real as it comes. Talk to me about the early months of Ramadi and what was going through your head. War is new to us. Um, you know, it's not a workup anymore. Like there's actually live rounds being thrown back at you. Like you're in contacts and I would say... You know, 75% of the time we went out, we were getting shot at. Um, it, it was after Mark that was who was killed that I actually wrote the, uh, the you know, your letter, whatever the, we call that, the letter to your family, if, uh, if the worst happens. Um, you know, a good point here, because it's going to lead into the story, is we had good intent, Doug, Benny. I, I don't think for us it was a question whether we go on that last mission or not. It, like the answer was, yeah, where, where do I need to be and with what? But we started to make a lot of planning errors with good intent. And, and what do they say? The, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Benny, talk, talk to me about that mission in, in inserting and in setting up on the rooftop of, uh, of that prominent building. So as far as the planning goes, um, I, I think this is kind of where we probably got a little bit complacent in our planning because we typically uh, did the same thing. Um, it, we did what worked. Um, so... We picked out two mutually supporting uh, rooftops that overlooked each other's uh, front doorways. So, like I say, they were mutually supporting each other. Um, but it was on the 
southern side of I think uh, Cop Eagle. So that was uh, kind of the the mindset was uh, to protect Cop Eagle because they were still doing some T barrier setup or something. Um, but we picked the southern side, which is um, I think was Al Farouk, which is an area that we really hadn't been down into yet. Uh, so it was still kind of new to us, but it was still probably the most dangerous in the Al uh, Malab district. So. Um, but we, I, I think we picked probably the best looking buildings, uh, with the imagery that we had. Um, maybe once we got set up, we probably could have looked at something a little different, but, um, I felt like the buildings we took were pretty good. They were, they were the prominent buildings. Yeah. I don't think there were any better sele- uh, selections. And we did do one mission in, in uh, the, 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 the Marab district, um, previous to that. And we'd actually, I think not that counts kill or matter, but I think we had racked up something like, uh. 14 kills on, on that operation. Yeah. So it was, it was a bad area. What, one of the most dangerous things, and you talked about complacency is we were, we like victory can be a dangerous thing. Growth can be a dangerous thing is we were highly successful. And it's not like we weren't looking at our procedures. We were doing after action reviews. And some of those after action reviews after a mission where we're tired being, having spent 48 hours in 130 degree uh, heat. I mean, we, we took one hour after actions to say, Hey, are we taking the right things? Do we need to adjust? But we were meeting with such a level of success. We're like, hey, let's just do more of it. Well, then what? And one element that I, I think is missed, and, and again, that most it's common misconception. You know, uh, a year or two at, later, uh, one of the folks that was speaking to me, um, one of the docs at uh, at uh, Buds, a great guy, um, he asked me, hey, we're not talking about that day anymore. Tell me about something else. Well, what else do you want to talk about, right? I mean, that's kind of the attitude. Didn't want to be there in the first place. But one of the things that I did bring up as a story was when you and I, I think it was on my birthday on the 27th, and we were, the three of us were in this, you know, uh, rooftop together. And we had a small set of, you know, loopholes that we were looking through, and that vehicle pulled in, and a shot rang out and, and narrowly missed basically hit the lip of the wall that we were laying down prone behind uh you know missing our sniper holes and we think it came from the trunk uh, of that vehicle uh, and then it took off and disappeared and he's like oh great that's a great story what did you do i'm like well benny and i looked at each other kind of laugh rolled out of the way uh looked at each other rolled back and got back on the gun he's like that's not a normal reaction to getting <laughs> shot at i'm like yeah, but for us Having been in it, in the thick of it, day after day after day, you know, you talk about complacency. I don't want to say we were complacent in our planning or, or strategy, but it literally became the norm to go out, expect to get into a firefight, sling some lead, you know, put some pressure and, and or impacts on the enemy, and then go home. I mean, that's that's what we were living for a while. So last mission, you guys insert like all the rest. September 28th, probably around 11 p.m. If I can remember, you leave uh, again. What was the cop eagle? Cop eagle, and patrol out of cop eagle into the night. The elements split each of the four man teams where, with their respective Iraqi scouts, and you assault or quietly take down the buildings, secure the families, and set up your sniper positions. Talk to me about the early mornings because I know we were in contact pretty early as the first of the 506 actually came in to do a clearance op in that general area. I mean, for me, the day, it has some fog to it, uh, to be honest. Um, I know that Mikey was watching the road and a row of houses to our backs. Uh, myself you and Benny, we set up our sniper overwatch positions. Uh, there was kind of a, a Z dog leg in the construction of the building. Uh, so I believe Benny had a big open field in the front door of our support. Looking east. In yeah. his sights, yes. You and I were both looking in the same general direction, slightly different angles, um, which coincidentally enough later led to, you know, our position switch. Uh, I do remember engaging uh, one enemy combatant earlier that day. Uh, I believe you did yes. as well. Yes. So, I mean, 
other than the first of the 506 doing clearance ops and us being in the area providing overwatch, I mean, it was it was kind of a somber day. I mean, it was traditional. It was hot. I mean, we had set up some sh shade structure material, uh, some things over our positions, trying to provide a little relief from the heat. Um, but it was kind of somber in the fact that it was really, other than those two initial engagements, it was quiet. And this was our, you know, this is our token last mission. I mean, we we're done at this point. Um, and based on previous inserts and, and operations and, and subsequent exfils, you know, we had done our engagements for the day. I mean, that was, you know, we were all just kind of chatting. I mean, to, to be honest, I mean, that's, you know, at one point Mike left the rear security because we also had a couple of the Iraqi support people up on the rooftop with us. And he came over and actually got on my gun and laid down in my, you know, sniper hole. Um, and it's one of the things that I regret the most, you know, it's always great leaders, I think, have the most self-reflection and continuously evaluate, you know, what we could have done differently. Um, but on this particular day, that's probably the greatest amount of time I ever spent one-on-one -on -one with Mikey was laying there next to him talking about the future and his next platoon and, and going home, et cetera. Um, so that's a difficult, difficult memory to, you know. I do remember there was a sense of excitement because we were proud of what we did. We were proud of the relationships we built with the, uh, the army and the Marine Corps. And I remember because those conversations were happening probably at a, a greater rate than most of our previous operations because of that excitement. But I remember talking with Mikey, he was excited because he was going to sniper school. If you remember that. Yes. And I remember talking to him about a girl he was dating. Um, and giving him advice, which is, I was not equipped to give on relationships, <laughs> like the uh, the worst person. Um, but I do know for me, I was talking about going home to see my little girl who's two years old. And I was, I was excited because it had been a long seven mm -hmm. months. Yeah, I was uh, only dating at the time. So um, and it was my high school sweetheart at the time. And now she's my wife. So um, and we got the three kids. So. Yeah, I owe that to Mikey. So, um, yeah, like you say, it was kind of a quiet morning other than the, the couple engagements you guys had. But I do want to bring in the fact that this was the, I want to say the first time that Jamil got his uh, first sniper kill as well. And he was part of the uh, the other uh, element. And I just remember how excited he was. So, um, and that he was one of our Iraqi uh, Jundies that was with us. And the fact that he got his first uh, enemy KIA, he was all excited about, so. And for the listeners, um, this is what we refer to as a partner force. We were not only uh, tasked with training training them to, to become an effective combat uh, element, but they also partnered and accompanied us on missions. And we had a close relationship with these guys. Two of them spoke almost perfect English, which is so rare. But um, we we did consider them part of the team. You know, there was definitely a lot of conversations going on that day, not not to give away our position or anything. At that point, after our two engagements, you know, it's kind of a TTP that we had, SOP. The gig's up. Everybody and their brother knows where we are. Uh, so, and we used that to our advantage on several previous operations um, with our, you know, Overwatch or mutually supporting positions. Uh, but there was a lot of conversation going on uh, because we were all excited. It was end of the time, as you said. I mean, who's not excited at the end of a deployment to get home and see their family and see their kids? I mean, at the time, you guys remember, I had three boys, uh, all grown now. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, getting off deployment meant I could get on a plane and head back to Georgia and see my kids. Um, so there was a lot to talk about and be excited about. The one thing that we I think was different or something that we saw was new, with, at least for the enemy TTP, was that they started setting up kind of blockade, like trash, blocking off the, the avenue's approach to our position. So they're, like I say, kind of marking off our position. And I don't, I don't think we really have ever seen this up to this point. Um, so... Um, in a way, I guess it, spider senses kind of kicked in, you know, like knowing that, knowing that something 
it was, it was probably coming, uh, but it still didn't alarm us t- enough to like really put us on guard. Like, uh, I mean, we were still on, on guard or, you know, we were still on, you know, observing through our, our sniper, um, uh, overwatch position stuff. But, um, this was something new that we saw. But I think given what we talked about earlier, the nature of, you know, complacency is the wrong word. I mean, that's an element for sure, but you tend to write out the scene in your head based on prior experience. And at that point we had a lot, um, you know, I mean, what was our T responsible for? I mean, uh, big numbers, uh, unprecedented in modern times. Um, but it was only a week or two prior that actually we were together and you were spotting, uh, with one of our, one of our scopes, uh, a guy hiding around a corner, uh, and leading up to the chain of events. I mean, we received an incoming explosion and all I could remember in my head was thinking, uh, once we, you and I had switched positions, basically you were on comms. I moved into your position, had a quite a uh, slightly wider field of view. Um, and it was sitting and it was over like a barrel or something that we had found, uh, versus the prone position next to it that I was in previously. Um, and we received that first explosion and all I could think in my head was that somebody launched an RPG at us from down the block. So that was what we were looking for. And actually is why Mikey moved from his secured position and came in and put himself in between you and I, uh, and next to Benny, cause we were all at that point basically huddled together, which, uh, in retrospect, probably not the best, uh, operational TTP, but, uh, we were together for a reason for very, for the overwatch and, and, uh, for where the holes were, you know, that we had to look through. And that, that call made sense. I remember we pulled Mikey back cause we're like, Hey, th- that, that, that position is no longer safe. Right. Cause he was out by himself yeah. on the other end of the building. Uh, for, for the audience. Now, one, the reason we, we were remaining in place, remaining over day as we call it, is that we were waiting for night to come. And once night had fallen, uh, we were going to extract under the cover of darkness, which just is tactically smart. It's smarter than uh, trying to extract a building uh, during the day. Uh, so we wanted to use technology to our advantage plus nightfall. Especially with what Benny said that, you know, we noticed a change in the enemy TTPs. So, you know, we brought it in tight 360 basically. Um, and we're, uh, as you said, waiting for night to fall. So now Benny, you're, you know, Doug, Mikey and I are within three feet of one another. You're probably six to, to eight feet uh, away from us looking the other direction. I remember, Doug, you're faced the same way as, uh, as Mikey towards that, that road, and I'm facing the opposite direction, sort of in uh, the Indian position. And I'm in and out of sleep because, again, what, it's 115 to 130 heat index. It's midday. We've had body armor. We have made a call. Hey, guys, if you need to take your body armor off from time to time, to cool off, then that's that's what you need to do. It's big boys ru- rules. You know the deal. You make the call. Were you falling in and out of sleep, or were you wide awake oh, at that time? Definitely. I mean, it was, you know, for all the reasons you already said. But uh, I remember Mikey joining us and getting on one of the sniper scopes, sitting between the two of us. Uh, so we were literally sitting, you know, on some whatever junk, rubbing elbows, and you were directly to his left uh Benny right behind us um when the initial explosion came in before Mikey came and joined us you know I thought I you know indeed into the wall but then we realized that's not the case all right what just happened game on I remember Mikey coming over like this is you know (laughs) we're gonna find where this guy just launched that at us and we're gonna find him I mean he was angry we're all angry I mean how dare you shoot at us I mean you know so we were looking for where that initial uh, action had come from, we assumed. Again, like I said, I, I think we even called it in as we think they might have shot an RPG at the building. Subsequently, we I think we all believe that it was the first attempt at uh, um, getting a grenade up on the roof. I'm glad that you guys bring that up, the falling in and out of sleep, because that's something that eats at me, um, because I know I was, and it's part that haunts me like the – part of me fall asleep at the wrong time, you know, when this event happened. Uh, So it brings me comfort knowing that, 
it also affected you guys. So, um, as you guys are listening to this, Benny, Doug, and I have never sat down and had this conversation, and, and we'll get to that. We we should have, and, and part of our senior leadership should have forced us to do that. I think it would have helped us deal with the trauma a little better had we talked through it immediately after it happened. So we get hit with an RPG, and then a little after that, it happens. And the grenade came over the the lip of the wall. And remember, we're on a a three-story building. Uh, This was one hell of a throw from whatever position the, the guy threw the grenade, but it barely came over the lip of the wall and Mikey, who was sitting in that seat, it hit him on the chest and dropped right between Doug, myself, and Mikey. Now, Doug, were you, did, I mean, were you startled when that happened? So I was on my rifle. Um, and, you know, so it came over just to my right because that's where Mikey was sitting. Uh, you know, and I remember either actually or through the fog, I remember... You know, I have in my head an image of what that grenade looked like. Um, I think what happened was looking back at the imagery after the fact, years later, I think that someone got up on the roof next door and the, you know, folks that we had with us on the rooftop, the two supporting guys, just didn't see it. Uh, And, you know, we were obviously focused looking in our direction in our sniper holes. Um, and I think that first explosion was them attempting to get one on top of us and it landed at the base of the building. Uh, and this second one, you know, made its way across. So, yeah, I mean, it bounced off Mike's chest, landed basically at his feet. You know, we're all rubbing elbows basically. Um, you know, and Mikey obviously covered the blast. Um, the most amazing thing out of that was, as we've talked about before, um, and it may or may not be in the citation, I mean, he was the only one that had a clear path to, uh, you know, jump out of the way if he wanted to. He probably would have taken shrap metal to the legs. Yeah, but he I mean, lived. he probably would, like, you know, you saw, he, he would definitely probably felt some of the blast, but um, because of the way the holes were set up, the sniper loop holes and the way the structures and the materials and, and the tables and, and everything that we had set up in order to be in the key positions we were in, he was on the edge of an opening and was the only one that had free access to um, that like two or three foot drop off lip of yes, the building. Yeah. So, I mean, um, there is fog, there's major fog. And sometimes I, 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 I can just hear the repeat of that boom, boom, the thing going off. And I think the only thing I, I, I remember is I sat there and, and just watched it happen with a dumb look on my face in total amazement. Because a testament to him, he didn't even, he didn't hesitate. And as it went off, he covered the majority of the blast, but it's not like the movies. When he, he covered the blast, he, he absorbed the most of the impact, but it also created a funnel to his left and right directly in uh, in Doug and, and Mai's position. And I know Doug and I had very close wounds, except you'd also broken a arm. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, just, you know, bilat uh, frag through both legs, and then a piece went through the leg. Uh, so technically a break, but... So Doug and I both had close to anywhere from 20 to 30 holes in the legs. And I don't know about you, Doug, but I was in, it sort of flipped me over. Correct. I probably was moving the, the uh, direction away from the grenade and it, it, the concussion sort of flipped me over onto my face and on my chest. And all I felt was a pain I've never felt before. I, whatever, whatever people say about getting shot and not feeling it, oh, I felt this. Yeah, so I was up against that, as we described, the Z in the wall, basically, um, you know, the architecture of the building. Uh, Mike and I were situated on a short section that formed the middle of that Z. So the blast, you know, that I absorbed, you know, that bypassed or or Mikey um, or went through Mikey, um, yeah, it bounced me 
off the wall and that explosion you could feel you know and from there things get a little foggy uh, from that concussion um i do remember my first recollection and again you know, how much of it after you know the explosion is is real or imagined i don't honestly know 100 percent, but uh my recollection was once uh you know you kind of shake off some of the you know what just happened um i remember distinctly benny rendering aid i remember you on the radio and i remember uh eventually the uh, jundies that were with us coming back up but without their weapons and so uh, i believe myself to have tried to instruct them on how to take the safeties off of our weapons to help benny at that point return fire uh, and, you know, you could hear the, the ensuing battle that later, actually not too long ago, I just found out was our guys. That's kind of how much we avoid talking about this was our guys had to, you know, troops in contact had to fight to get to our position, uh, you know, to come to our aid. Uh, big, huge firefight happened. You know, that was the kickoff. Um, so I know the uh, concussion of the grenade had shut my embitter off my radio and still I wasn't prepared to look at my legs I didn't know if I had legs because of the pain and I tried to get up and, and walk over because my radio was shut off but I knew that uh, Muhammad had the motor roll on him and so I, cr- I crawled over to him got that motor roll and that's actually the radio I was using because I knew Seth who was in charge of the other rooftop had Iraqis that had the motor roll us over and, to Jamil I think yeah that. and to, to show how off I was, I think I, I said mayday over the uh, the radio. I said, troops in contact, we, we, we need help now. This is our position. And I, I put an all-hands mayday call on the, uh, the, the radio. But I do remember both and I, you and I, got back to Mikey. And I remember we're touching his chest and saying, hey, hold on, man, hold on. And there's not much you can patch up when somebody jumps on a grenade. But I do remember this. I remember you watching or watching you fire his, his Mark 48. And I've never seen up to that point, as much as I knew, I've never seen a look on your face of such rage. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my perspective, uh, like I say, I was laying prone behind Mikey. So the blast, when it went out, obviously the side blast went out and hit you too. And then what went between his legs is what gave me shrapnel to my calves. Um, all I remember is hearing the word grenade, I heard the blast, and then when I woke back up, you know, I think I was only out for a few seconds, is I, I woke back up to utter chaos. Um, grown men screaming, moaning, um, just a scene that, you know, I, I would like to forget, but obviously I never will. Um, I remember uh, dragging Mikey to a position more into the center of the rooftop just to get away from the the lip of the rooftop just to be able to in case another uh, grenade came up onto the rooftop or you know i didn't you know i had no idea what was next um like i say i know that we were in a the middle of a firefight because you know there's rounds going off and the whole communication to the other squad trying to get over to us um but you know mikey uh doing a, just a quick assessment that i could uh seeing you seeing doug uh, you know, Mikey's got labor, labored breathing. Um, he's got, you know, uh, blood coming out of everything. You know, there's uh, small air bubbles, you know, coming from everything. Um, so the little bit of the, the medical equipment that we had on us because we didn't have the medic with us, you know, is our, just our little blowout kit. So I'm, I'm breaking his open. I'm breaking mine open. And, you know, the chest, astrum and chest seals aren't sticking anything because there's so much blood everywhere. Uh, the gauze, you know, I'm trying to wrap up and stuff into everything I could. Um, it's not working. You know, like just, I felt like every medical thing that we ever been taught up to that point just wasn't working. Um, uh, so after, you know, I did as much as I could with him for, you know, that, that moment. Um, I think after the radio communication got out to the, get the other guys over to us cause we were in the middle of that firefight. Um, uh, I felt uh like say vulnerable i felt scared i felt um just alone um and then uh rage took over uh i remember picking up mikey's 48 
And the best thing that I felt at that time was what can I do to help get support to me? And that was to pick up his gun and help provide suppressive fire to get our other element over. Because like I said, um, I did, I fell alone. Um, cause you guys, all three of you were majorly wounded and, um, I took the least of it. So, um, yeah, it was the last one that ever shot his 48. Um, <clears throat> And uh, his his forty eight still in Team Three, and every time I'd go back to Team Three, it's in the display case, and that's a constant reminder of uh, that event too. So it was hard going back to Team Three, but um. there is a major sense of guilt that Doug. I don't know how you feel that we couldn't find a way to stand on our own two feet and pick up our guns and and hold the line until uh, help and. and you talk about feeling helplessness. Doug and, are, Doug and I are lying next to Mikey watching the firefight go on. Yeah, it was completely helpless feeling. I mean, for the first time, we were out of the fight when we needed to be in the fight. So as the element fought its way to us one time, totally distorted, uh, it seemed like forever. I, I know we're in pain. We don't have morphine. Uh, it probably, in reality, probably was only five minutes. But I remember they run up to the rooftop. and Somebody had already called for a Bradley to come on Farouk, the backside of us. And I remember two guys picked me up, like, you know, sort of my arms around their shoulders. And they're like, hey, how do we get to the alley? And I remember we're leading them down. You're behind me. And then uh, let's just say uh, Jay was tasked with carrying Mikey. And, and Jay is one of the a physical phenomena. He's a physical freak. And the Bradley's waiting. They throw Doug and I in there. And then Jay lays Mikey down into the back of the Bradley and jumps in with us. And I remember, again, we're looking at Mikey. It's almost like just staring at what you had caused. And Jay was physically exhausted. And I, I, I felt bad. I, I, I sort of had to yell at him. I'm like, hey, what are you doing? Hey, start chest compressions on him. And he sort of snapped too. And we've talked about that. And he said, hey, thanks thanks for snapping me out of it. I'm like, bro, I'm sorry. I, I yelled at you. But it seemed like that ride to the Corregidor aid station seemed like 30 minutes, man. Yeah, I remember, uh, it's funny, it was, uh, I had broken out, whatever. I remember watching what Benny just described. Um, and again, you know, feeling like there's something we could or should be doing, but couldn't. <clears throat> I remember Seth, Seth, who's no longer with us, um, stopping at me and assessing the situation. I remember, uh, you know, a guy, uh, we'll call him DV, dropped a, a, an additional tourniquet on my stomach and, you know, to put on me. Um, and then I remember us getting, you know, packaged up the best we could, getting ready to exfil uh, and trying to stand up. Once I was lifted, trying to, to bear weight, couldn't. Um, and, and and for the first time, there was a moment of, uh, of humor in, in a very tragic situation because I remember thinking, Seth, literally carried me down the stairs and out the back to the Bradley and remember thinking, Oh yeah, this is payback for when I had to carry you like a thousand yards out of the nylon during one of our training events gear and all. So I'm like, yeah, this is, this is a, uh, this is comical. Um, but yeah, I remember getting into the Bradley, uh, wondering where Benny was quite honestly. Uh, and then quickly realizing there's only four guys left out there cause there's four of us in the Bradley. So we swapped a person, uh, and then, you know, that was probably the longest ride of my life back to, you know, you know, being there next to Mikey for that ride. Uh, and Benny, you, you had to go back up on that rooftop, get all the serialized equipment, get our weapons, then go back to the other rooftop that the guys were on, get that equipment and then extract. Yeah. So to back up just a little bit, trying to get Mikey off the rooftop, you know, I, I was helping Jay, um, and to, to carry essentially dead weight. Um, and Mikey wasn't a small person, um, and just 
being covered in blood, you know, he's slick. Um, it was hard cause the, the stairwell that went up to the rooftop wasn't that wide. So like just trying to move that, his body down, um, it, like, see, you talk about Jay being exhausted. Like, I remember just being absolutely just wiped. Um, but, yeah, loading uh, – I was there. I loading all three of you guys up in the back of the Bradley. And, uh, you know, once you watch the ramp go up, you're like, I don't know when's the next time I'm going to see you guys. Um, but, yeah, so ramp goes up, and I'm still there. Uh, I have to immediately, like you say, kind of compartmentalize that that – incident is done now i'm still in the the thick of the the operation or the fight so uh we were forced to kind of go back up to the rooftop and get all of our sensitive gear you know obviously you know weapon systems are still up there communication systems backpacks rucksacks all that kind of stuff so uh, and what hits me when we get back up to the rooftop is obviously uh with it still being you know that heat index uh, of well over 100 degrees wherever is you know where they're was this huge puddle of blood is now like this red paste of uh the because it's so hot it's drying up so fast but then there's also the, the reminders of all the medical uh gauzes and all the the 762 rounds the, the casings that are up there so all this the scene itself um and what kind of hits me is like if you know you kind of think about it all that stuff was kind of put there because of me um so I felt like that scene, uh, it, it's like another, uh, it's a reminder, like it kind of just eats at me. Like a lot of that stuff that was left on that, on the rooftop, um, uh, was put there because of me. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we pack everything up, uh, get that rooftop, uh, everything off there. And then we had to basically go back to the other rooftop where, uh, uh, Seth, uh, uh, Overwatch was at and get all the stuff that they had left as well. And then uh, once we got all their stuff, we went back to uh, Cop Eagle's Nest. And then that's where we actually finally got to the point where, like, uh, you're able to take a breath. And that's when I actually uh, started to take all my equipment off. And that's when I actually finally realized that I was hit as well. Um, I took my my pants off and realized I had been hitting the calves as well. Um, but the adrenaline was so high, I just never realized it until we got back to the, the Eagle's Nest. I don't think I told you yet, told you guys this, but on our deployment in 2008, you know, we went to Sadr City and then I had to go back to Ramadi. And two nights before we rotated out in 2008, I asked uh, RTU Commander Jack if he would put the guys at risk if I could go back to that rooftop. Remember, Ramadi is almost absolutely secure at this point. There was nothing going on. But again, we had to take volunteers, and the guy said, absolutely, and I went back to the rooftop in 2008. The chair you were sitting in was still there. Ear cups from our Peltor headsets, uh, casings, uh, flex cuffs, water bottles. Al-Qaeda had come in days after that incident and had kicked the family out. And where our loopholes were, they had knocked down those walls so snipers could never use them again. But uh, it was surreal to go back to that uh, that rooftop. And the guys gave me a moment alone uh, up there. So one thing you didn't see, Benny, which was a testament to the relationship that all the guys had built, is it seemed like all of the first of the 506 was on the other side of the road where the cop was waiting for us as that Bradley came in and they put Doug and I and Mikey on stretchers. And I remember specifically, you know, Ron Clark and Dave Womack there. Um, and they get us into the, the aid station. I remember getting the first shot of morphine. And I looked at the, uh, the army soldier, the, the medical technician. I'm like, hey, and again, like you say some dumb things in times of uh, dire times. And I didn't feel the morphine from the initial shot. And I looked at him and I grabbed him by his lapel. And I'm like, hey, I'm a seal. You need to ramp that shit up. <laughs> and he sort of, you saw this look of annoyance and he gave me another shot. And that's when it, it kicked in. I remember getting, you know, once we were offloaded, getting into treatment. Of course, it's a flurry of memories and fog, but getting everything cut off and they're doing their, you know, head to toe examinations on us. And you and I are laying in bed side by side because we were, you know, 
for for those brief moments and i don't know how long it was for uh thinking man we were coking and joking to the point that some of the staff actually started laughing with us you know we're sitting there you know blowed up for all intents and purposes and um coking and joking about what they're doing about what they're about to do what procedure they're about to do on us um because we're high on morphine right i mean so until i overheard someone you know say and you know at that moment i think you and i both probably had a moment of clarity and you know got the word um and i remember them uh as they packaged us up getting ready to move uh we asked or someone offered you may have asked i don't remember uh for a moment and they gave us that i remember moving outside of course we're strapped down to the the gurney they can't do surgery it's an aid station they need to get uh Doug and I to, to Habania, where there's a surgical capability as quickly as possible. But I remember Dave Womack took the Oakleys off his his face and put them, put them on me because we're directly in the sun. And I remember Ron Clark with Mikey and the CH-47 comes in and we go off. As we got to Habania, they, they needed to get us into surgery rapidly. But since they knew we, we weren't in, in as much pain with morphine, and Doug, I don't know if you remember this. They wanted to give us a uh, three, three to five minutes with uh, Mikey's body, which was at the time I, I didn't appreciate it because it, it felt like rubbing a, a dog's nose in the mess that they had just created. Like y- you did this, but I, I again they had the best intent. But I remember. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was difficult. Um, And yeah, there's an extreme sense of guilt. And a part of me wishes I could have that. We, we, I remember talking with Doug because then after that surgery, we went to Blad and then they prepared us to go to Germany where we had additional okay. surgeries. And I felt so grateful to have Doug with me. I, I think misery loves company in, in a sense. And I remember we, I remember we talked about you. We're like, I bet he wished he could be with us right now because you probably felt alone even though you were surrounded by all the guys in the, in the platoon. Yeah, I was, definitely wish I was with you guys. Um yeah, like I had the brothers, uh, you know, everybody from the platoon, but felt, um, you know, in a sense, kind of removed. Like um, I felt like they didn't quite experience, you know, what I had gone through. So to be able to like try to to grieve and to reflect on what happened with people that weren't there during that moment. Um, I think made it more difficult, at least for myself. So, yeah, I wish definitely I could have been with you guys. But um. I do remember in Germany, you know, one, we, we had a lot of visitors. I mean, and stuff, even when we got to Habania, the task unit there led by Rob was all there. I mean, that brotherhood wraps their arms around you and they do what they can to, to, to console you as best as possible. But D- Doug and I had a bad nurse. Do you remember this? She was older and she was just sort of rude. And so we got testy with her and they'd always ask how much pain are you in? Of course, the answer was going to be 10 because I want the morphine. And she was rude to us and we gave a rude answer and she injected the morphine quickly. And you and I got like severe nausea to the point of like we wanted to to, to throw up. And I remember we were laughing. I, I remember one of our visitors, he was talking to you at the time, uh, another officer. And, uh, you know, I remember may have been the same testy nurse because there's actually there's actually a uh, note in my chart that I looked at years later about uh, that incident where you know they had done something you know they were looking at me from waist up but some guy or nurse had came over and dropped like a clipboard on my feet and I went off on him for you know like got injuries down here brother yeah Yeah. and so you know you were kind of giving me the hey man there's a visiting important VIP officer here (laughs) and I'm like hey you know so that was funny and then um I mean yeah you talk about the community and the brotherhood and and the way we support each other I think that is definitely an element that we have that 
possibly no one else in the military has. I mean, we went to Habania. One of our old platoon mates was there and actually helped with the initial surgery. They assigned two guys out of there, one team guy each, to basically go with us 24-7 until we got back, you know, home. Um, so... You know, and then when we got to Germany, of course, we have elements from the East Coast that was there. And, one, you know, one of my best friends to this day, Shawnee, showed yeah. up in the middle of the night. With his platoon. We, yeah, when, and was basically guys that we had went to buds with and guys that were deployed to Germany at the time. You know, he came in and was, you know, arguing with the nurse in the hallway that, you know, you know, it's past visiting hours. And he's like, yeah, that's not going to that's not going to sit well. Uh, so he came on in the room and he's visiting us, bringing us beers and magazines. And I remember he brought me an airsoft, uh, one of those little plastic airsoft pistols to, you know, he's like, anybody starts pissing you off, you know, just shoot them. Uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, the community definitely wrapped themselves around us uh, from the moment until, you know, to this day. But uh, I think that's something that we do. Uh, I well, do remember even Admiral McRaven. Came and saw us. He was in charge of soccer at the time. Brought his wife. Brought his son. Um, I believe his nice his wife's name is Ro, uh, Roseanne. I'm, I'm, I'm getting that wrong. Um, but uh, I mean, she had baked us brownies, but we could not eat a thing. Um, and then from Germany, we go to Bethesda. Bethesda, we fly to San Diego and our families, and we get discharged pretty quickly there. We're both in wheelchairs. Um, I know the integration back into my home. My, my daughter was scared. She was two. She's two. But the dude she saw leave did not look like the dude that came back in a wheelchair, and she wouldn't even come to me. And that reintegration was tough uh, for me. And I know the dread, the dread, which I did not want to do, was we had to prepare to go to the, the funeral. And the dread was I did not want to look Mikey's family in the face and say we had failed, or even say I'm sorry, because that falls so freaking short uh, of of anything. Yeah, I remember leaving Germany, and there was a problem with the loading ramp or something, and you and I threatened to unbuckle and get off the gurney and get upstairs, because we weren't going to miss, in my mind, I wasn't going to miss the funeral. Um, but, you know, once we're back stateside, you know, my kids were on the East Coast, um, so I didn't get to see them right away for, for several months, um, which, you know, it's tough on its own, but a savior in some ways for what you just described. Uh, so, you know, um, but ramping up, getting ready to speak at the funeral, being introduced to Mike's family, which, again, extremely difficult. I mean, how else do you describe it as, as other than what you said, which is you feel responsible a hundred percent um but i will say the family was uh extremely uh welcoming and uh thoughtful considerate of us and i remember you joined us and it was the first time we got to to, to really see you, but you know, what, what sticks is, is, you know, I'm, I'm building up the courage to, to talk to, to Mikey's mom, to, to, to meet the family. And I remember the two of us getting the wheelchairs cause we rode in the same car. I think you were in that car as well. Um, is you're getting ready and she comes up and when we don't know what she looks like and she comes up and the first words out of her mouth, if I don't know if you remember this is I'm so glad you guys are okay. Whatever pre-planned thing I had said to say is gone. Testament to that family and the fact that they are so selfless and all they do is care about others is why Mikey was who Mikey was. That funeral was awful. What, what were your feelings going through that? I know I have my set of perceptions. Well, I know we kind of talked about it the other day or yesterday that one, like, like it felt like all eyes were on us. Um, the whole, 
it just felt like the whole kind of community was looking at us. Um, like I say, the family f- I felt like was very opening and glad that we were okay. Um, but like how long it took uh, for the tridents being pinned onto the coffin and that sound echoing through Rosecrans there, like it just, it was, uh, I don't even know how to put a word to it. Um, it's hollow. Yeah, hollow is a good word. Just that thumping sound, what felt like forever. Um, and, you know, you feel bad for the family because all you want to do is um, help close it, close out their, their loss and, you know, Yeah, it just felt like it, it, it carried on. It, it seemed like it was way too long. But, um. I know we've talked about this, and I know the answer, but uh, I'll, I'll ask it anyways. Do you guys keep up with the family? No. No. I know you did intimately in, in, in the year after and probably the, the 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 few couple of years after Mike's death, and, and I'm the same way. I don't keep up with the family. Just wanted to hear why that's so hard to do. I mean, I think it's what we've already discussed. It's the is that guilt and responsibility and not wanting them to relive that every time they see us. Probably wrong to feel that way or to have not kept up with the family. Um, because every time I've seen them at the few events that I participated in over the years, the last time and one of the only times the three of us seen each other was the, the commissioning ceremony. Um, uh, you know, it's big hugs and smiles and, and all around and, and, and uh, that same welcoming, uh, you know. You want to reclose that box because that box opens every time I see you guys. And then I'll see you in five years, reopen that box, and I'm going to close it as quickly as possible again. Yeah, it's that reminder. Um, and I, I feel that whole, yeah, the, this, the guilt and the shame pops back up. Like I... I go to all, you know, these big events, the christening, the commissioning, uh, the Camp uh, Monsieur La Posa uh, dedication stuff. You know, I go for the family, but at the same time, it, like you say, it opens that box back up and you, the whole guilt and shame creeps back in. And it's just that reminder that, you know, it, it eats away at you. Um, so in a way, it's just easier to keep that box closed. Yeah, I know for... Uh... For you guys as, as well as myself, uh, some of your kids were born. All your kids were born. Uh, your daughter was already here. My older son's were already here, but you know my youngest son Evan was born after, um, and he has this just connection to Mikey. Um, and before him, uh, you know what I would say, you know, what we call him, you know, a very close friend of mine and mentor, his family. We've always been close, another team guy. Um, his son did the same thing in Cub Scouts, uh, and they would always go to Rosecrans and, and plant the flags. And uh, and when he was older, my son took over that charge. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, it's a humbling moment when, you know, your son that's never met Mike, you know, has to ensure that, um, you know, his gravesite is secured so that he can be the one to plant the flag. I think that's partly why I had to get out of San Diego. Is I'm sure like you guys, I would go to Fort R- Rosecrans, which for the listeners is the military uh, cemetery located uh, very close to the SEAL teams on, on the West Coast. And I'd bring a new trident and I'd leave it on top of his tombstone every Sunday. Uh, and in fact, one of those t- Sundays, I remember I was going to get donuts for my daughter coming back from that. It was early Sunday morning. 
and I walked across the street, and the cop gave me a, a ticket for jaywalking. Uh, and uh, I, I could not talk my way out of that one and got very, very heated. But I, I had to get out of San Diego. It was that constant uh, reminder of, uh, of that. I know one of the things, even though we pride ourselves on after action reviews, we never sat down and talked about that day other than writing whatever citations we had to write or or witness statements for Mikey's Medal of Honor, which he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor by President Bush. Yeah, I remember being in the hospital and you and I writing. Yeah. To write it up. Uh, I mean, that's a slam dunk. One that happens very rarely, but when somebody chooses to jump on a grenade, there are very few outcomes but death. And you're giving your life to save your brothers. Do you think had we sat down, if leadership had forced us to to sit down and say, hey, let's talk through this. We're not looking to place blame, but there are some definite lessons learned that need to be passed to the next generation or the SEAL teams deploying after you. Do you think that would have helped with the overall healing from that trauma? I don't know that it would have helped the overall healing per se. Um, I mean, it's been 15 years and this is the first time the three of us are literally in a room together talking through the event. Um, it should have happened. But like we talked about earlier before the, you know, before we started recording, I mean, I think in a way, our community operating at the level we do on the two-year cycle that we operate on, uh, you know, the greatest attribute, in my opinion, of a, of a leader is that growth, development, self-reflection, uh, and it changes all of us. I mean, you change just by maturation, but an event like this causes, I think, a deeper more impactful change um, to your decision making and your process. As you said, you left the West Coast and went to the East Coast. Benny jumped right back in the fight. I decided I never wanted to be in charge of a platoon again and went to the Singleton, uh, at least as much Singleton as I could. And and I did some great, fun, meaningful deployments is a better word after that, but it was only putting myself in harm's way. It wasn't directing other guys to get into harm's way. Um, that was my path afterwards. Um, but I think to my point is that even if we had done the AAR and I've been and set through a couple of, of briefings where someone would come out and talk about, you know, the mission, all they want to talk about is the mission, but no one ever wants to talk about what went wrong and why. And because it's like a, it's a, it's a negative or black mark on the community versus looked at as an attribute to learn from our mistakes. We compartmentalize it individually. And as a community, we compartmentalize those events that are tragic and that, you know, um, weren't anticipated, planned for, and that, you know, happened, um, at, at least in my experience, in my exposure. The difficult conversations. You the have to have the conversations. difficult conversations from which the most learning takes place. Because nobody wants to hear what they did wrong. Nobody wants to talk about the lessons learned. And as we talked about earlier, we live on a two-year cycle, especially as leaders. In most venues, especially the military, in our community, we live on two-year cycles. So you've got two years to make an impact and, and write a decent fit rep to get prepared for the next gig. So you really don't have the time invested, you know, to you spend the first six months figuring out the new command or the new job. You spend the last six months getting ready for the next gig. So you got a year to come up with something to make a change so that you have something to put into the fit rep. Um, and, and that's not all bad. It's just, it's, it's cyclic and it's short. Um, so I think we could do a much better job uh, learning from both positive and negative. So, if I, and we're in Boulder, Colorado recording this, if I pulled 10 people off the street right now and said, hey, have you ever heard of Michael Monsoor? The answer is probably no. And especially for our youth, this is somebody who should be talked about in school. Not for the component of war, for the component of such selflessness and sacrifice. 
what, you know, you're looking at an audience right now. What would you want them to know about Mikey? About the amazing, not perfect, but the amazing individual he was and how we can all strive to be a little more like Mikey. First off, I'd say like just his uh, hard work ethic. Like he never complained about anything. Like if the mission entailed him being a communicator and an automatic weapons gunner and like if for whatever reason he had to carry something else, he never complained about it. Like he would man up and just do it. Um, so like uh, like his hard work ethic, I think, was uh, definitely uh, a huge uh, attribute that he carried. Um, and he was definitely uh, a humble person. Like he, I, I definitely feel I, I carry my humility or my humblenism, and you know if that's a word, um, based off of him. Nothing came easy to him. No. He was not the most talented SEAL. Nothing came easy, but he just, no quit. No quit, yep. Yeah, like you said, I mean, the greatest attributes Mikey possessed was his humility, his loyalty to the team, to the fight, his selflessness and sacrifice, obviously. Um, And it's unfortunate that, uh, as you alluded to, a lot of people don't know who he is um, or what he did, and they should. I mean, there's, there's... one, just for the greatness of the individual, you know, uh, that served this country. But as we're talking about, you know, what makes a great leader, um, finding the uniqueness within someone and forcing them, forcing them or encouraging them to get outside of their comfort zone, get outside of that box and get better at what you're not good at that's going to help you become not only competent but confident in your abilities. And, and he – represented all of those things um you know i used to say it as a as a shooting instructor uh you know i can train you and make you competent and i can mentor you to make you confident because you got to have the competency to run a gun you got to have the confidence to take the shot um but that translates to anything else we do in this world corporate or otherwise i mean you got to find those uniquenesses within each individual find out what they enjoy, find out what they're passionate about. You kind of got to pull those strings, you know, peel back those layers um, and encourage development. Uh, Because be honest, most people either lack the initiative, the drive, or a skill set, a competency, uh, or the confidence to succeed. Uh, And I think great leaders find those things and and help uh, do all three of the things I said earlier, coach, teach, and mentor. Um, Mikey certainly represented the best in all of us and had the humility to uh, live his life that way. He was, he was a quiet dude. He was a man of few words. He didn't need to. He, he, he spoke through his actions. Do you guys remember what he wrote under the bill of his, uh, his cover? It was like, never quit or? I'll never, I'll never quit. quit. Oh, yeah. I will never quit. I'll never quit. But yeah, his other line was no, no regrets. Was, no yeah, no regrets. No regrets. No regrets. Yeah. No regrets. I remember when uh, his mother had uh, those dog tags made for us. I mean, that was yeah. his mantra was, uh, you know, it's no regrets. Tombstone. It's on his tombstone. No regrets. Live your life so that the fear of death can never enter your heart. And, and he lives up to that. I think the thing that, uh, again, you find this out after the fact of what he'd written to his mom. But you guys remember the line, I'm with the boys, and that's as good as it gets? He'd written that, I'm with the boys, and that's as good as it gets. That's awesome. He believed in his tribe, and we were his tribe. And a testament to his character that you guys have just described, he was willing to give his life to protect anyone in that uh that tribe. Do you guys feel fortunate to, I mean, I say that that day was my worst day and it was also my best day. Worse than that, we lost Mikey, but I feel fortunate that very few people 
ever see such a act of sacrifice like that. And I, I feel fortunate when I say that. It's not, I wish I didn't have to see that, is that he was in our lives. For the aspect of, of Mikey, of course, fortunate to have uh, been in his company, to have seen something that selfless. Um, and obviously, you know, parts of our lives, our children, my son Evan, is only here because of that. But I think you struggle, you know, we obviously are struggling right now, but you struggle with what happened and, uh, you know, a lot of internal strife and self-reflection. I mean, I think there's, you know, I read it, I don't know who said it, and it's not bravado, it's, I don't think warriors are meant to survive the battlefield. Otherwise, we wouldn't have 22, 23 Soldiers killing themselves every day via suicide. Um, and we wouldn't have such a tough time transitioning back to the normal world. Um, that's just a fact. Yeah, at least it is for me. It, it's difficult. You know, you, you learn, you grow, you're educated, and you live your life doing a thing, getting to the Super Bowl. And then it's over. And yet figure out what's next. And hopefully it's family. Hopefully it's our wives and our kids and our loved ones. And uh, But that in itself is difficult. For a lot of guys and girls. Well, there's trauma with war. And we'll continue to deal with that. that and that's, that's, that's life. And we're not going to move on easily knowing that Mikey's not with us. But the best parts of him are with us. When, when you talk about them like you are now. But for, and for all those veterans listening, as you talked about the veteran suicide, you got to look at the bright side too. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers for he who sheds his blood with me today is forever my brother. It's been 15 years in, on September 29th, one week from now, 15 years since we've sat down or, or, or forced ourselves to sit down and have this talk. And I don't want it to be another 15 years. And my concern for you guys too is I want you guys to be f- freaking happy. And I know Mikey would want us all to smile and live our lives. Any last thoughts? you want to share with the listeners about Mikey or just the ordeal all in, it, in and of itself? It was an honor to, to live and serve with Mikey. Um, like Doug kind of hit, you know, my kids know who Mikey was. Um, I tried to instill the characteristics that Mikey, you know, taught and I carry you uh, instill and try to teach those to my kids. Uh, even as when I was an instructor, I tried to tell Mikey's story uh, to all the new students coming up to become Navy SEALs, um, his story, just because it needs to be told um, because he he's one of the best. He is the best. Um, and like I say, it's truly been an honor. I can only echo that. I did the same thing as a BUDS instructor. You know, it's tough, but sometimes you get there, they want to hear the story or they've heard, uh, you know, they get to know that, you know, you were there and they want to hear. So you tell the story the best you can. Um, it, you know, it was certainly an honor to serve with him and with you guys. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, I guess the best piece of advice I ever got was, you know, uh, from Mike's dad. And it was the brief moment we talked and it was, you know, just you know, live a happy life, enjoy your life. Was that the, was that at the USS Monsoor commissioning? Uh, that was when we, uh, initially came home and we first met the family. Didn't know what to say. 
didn't know how to engage, you know, and uh, haven't really engaged with him since. I spoke to him briefly at the commissioning, uh, but, uh, you know, he was a Vietnam era warrior. Um, so can't imagine what that's like. And, uh, you know, not sure if one of my children will follow in the military footsteps. And obviously that's always at the forefront of your mind and the concern, uh, you know, um, how I personally would handle that. But all I can say is Mikey was the best. And he uh, embodied uh, the best of all of us. An amazing family. An amazing man. Guys, you know, I've learned that we don't say this enough, and I'm going to close this way. I love you guys. Love you too, I genuinely love you guys. And I want you to be happy. And I'm sorry for not keeping up with you the way I should. And I know you feel same the same deal. way. Same yeah. Thank you for opening up on a subject that, quite frankly, none of us want to talk about in showing that even the most elite of our warriors can show vulnerability, which right now is uh, rare in, uh, in the society that we have. So, guys, I thank you. Safe travels home. I love you.